test, test. Is the static gone? All right. It's me. I'm the problem. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Friends, welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. I have a few announcements, actually several announcements. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, lift up probably the, the announcement that's most burdensome. Uh, Dolores Drumheller passed away last night. Um, she was at home uh, with her son. Hal was there. Uh, so she was in peace, no pain. Uh, she she died the way she wanted to, uh, so we will all keep everyone abreast of, of funeral arrangements and the services, but certainly keep uh, the whole Drumheller family in your prayers. But as I know, Dolores would uh, tell us we need to rejoice, we need to proclaim, because she is in a much better place uh, than we are, and so we will continue to cry and mourn her loss, but we know that uh, that, that is heaven's gain, and that's her gain, uh, to be with our Lord and Savior uh, in that union that we also desire. So again, just wanted to make that announcement and please keep them in your prayers. Also today, you'll see that uh, there are two gentlemen up here with robes and stoles. Uh, today we're a uh, guest preacher this morning is Reverend Dan McKenty. Uh, and if you probably guess, you probably look around, you'll see some, uh, some new faces. We welcome again the PNC from St. Andrew Presbyterian Church. Uh, welcome and also see some other new faces here. Okay. Looks like uh, Gary and Jane Strebel strolled on in. <laughs> welcome, welcome. It's always good to have you all join us. Um, other announcements, just wanted to run through them. Our session will meet after church today. A uh, youth group will be meeting this evening. Uh, and then Tuesday morning, uh, we'll have continue in our Bible study. And then Tuesday evening, we're going to have a Shrove Tuesday pancake dinner uh, fundraiser that the youth is hosting. Uh, Half of the funds will go to the youth group's programs, and the other half is going to go to uh, Puerto Rico, to our uh, partner uh, church there, Pastor Elvis uh, there in Toa Alta, and uh, we look forward to continuing to serve with him. So if you get a chance, please come out Tuesday evening at 6. A prayer fellowship will meet Wednesday morning, 930. Uh, please uh, write down any prayer requests if you have them, or you're certainly more, wel more than welcome to join us. Um, and then that evening... Uh, Ash Wednesday, we will be meeting here at 6.30 for a uh, service of the imposition of ashes. Uh, so those sort of a rundown of, of this week. Any other announcements this morning? The lunch starts at Correct. Yes. Thank you for reminding me. So the um, uh, second helping lunches that normally are happening in our fellowship hall, they're going to continue happening, but it'll be uh, Lenten lunches. And so there'll be bag lunch, and I think a series of, well, I know a series of ministers will be giving uh, a, a short meditation during that lunch hour. So, of course, if you have a lunchtime free, you're more than welcome to join us here in the sanctuary and then uh, in the fellowship hall for lunch. Thank you. And that's at 12 noon. Any other announcements? All right. Seeing none, let us prepare our hearts to worship the Lord.
Good morning. morning. Hear now our call to worship from the second psalm. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens and laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he not become angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Come, let us worship God with hymn number 150, Come Christians, join to sing.
Please be seated. The Apostle James urges us, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you who sin, and purify your hearts, you who are double-minded. As Christ's church, as members of the body of Christ, let us come together and offer our unison prayer of confession. Will you take a moment and will you pray with me? Holy God, you set before us a rich feast of blessing, but we are drawn to lesser things that cannot satisfy. Our ways are not your ways. Our thoughts do not ascend to your thoughts. Forgive us when we fall short of your commands for our lives. We ask this in the name of our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Be assured, beloved, God's love is sure and steadfast, always providing a way out, a way through, a way back to him. Through the waters of baptism, we have died with Christ and we are raised with him. With gratitude in faith, we will walk the way of the cross. Thanks be to God. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Christ, peace be with you.
Church, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please join me in prayer. We seek you in your word, O God, as though we are searching for water in a dry and weary land. By the power of your Holy Spirit, may this word be to us a rich feast, satisfying the soul. Then with our mouths, we will praise you, and with our lives, we will bless you, our host and our hope. Amen. The Old Testament lesson comes from Leviticus, chapter 19, verses 9 through 18. Please listen for the word of God. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest, and you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the falling grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
All right. I don't know if many of you all know the, the story of that uh, hymn, so I just want to share a little bit briefly. Uh, when we went to Puerto Rico and served on that mission trip, uh, Pastor Elvis of the Iglesia Cristiana Cristo Redentor, uh, he is strongly encouraged the mission team uh, to come and offer uh, a hymn that we've never sung before. I'm not sure many of us, I don't know if anyone on that trip heard this, heard this song before, uh, but it was probably one of the best moments that we had on that mission trip. And of course, it was, I'm sure, an am amazing and amusing sight seeing a whole bunch of frozen chosen uh, <laughs> before the, this Puerto Rican Pentecostal congregation. Uh, but my friends, it was uh, one of the best, like I said, the best moments of that entire trip. And so I'm so glad that the choir was able to offer that to you all this morning. And so in that same vein, I'd like to encourage each of us to offer to our Lord, uh, not only from our uh, treasures, but of our time and of our talents as well. Let us pray. God, who guides us through wilderness and promised land, in days of want and in days of plenty, you have been with us. By these gifts we now share, may others know of your providence and care. Send us not only our offerings, but our very selves to console and comfort, to lift up and reach out, to listen and sit beside your children everywhere at the one table you have set. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And now we enter the portion of our service where we lift up our prayers for our families, for our friends, for the church, and for the world. Of course, I ask that you please keep the drumheller in your drumheller family in your prayers as we mourn the loss of, of Dolores. Are there any others you wish to lift up at this time? Yes, Linda? So the McLaughlin. Damn. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, goodness. That's terrible. So, um, yeah. Oh, goodness. So Lana Lowe, right? We'll certainly keep her in our prayers as well. Thank you. Jean?
Thank you, Gene. Thank you. We certainly praise the Lord that he went through that surgery very well, and we continue to pray for him as he mends. Thank you. Any other prayer requests? Yes, Ron. Thank you, Ron. We'll certainly keep the Kairos ministry team and you yourself in our prayers as uh, you all minister to those uh, inmates, I guess the residents at the Green Rock, uh, Green Rock Prison. Yes, Alice. It's important to pray for safety, for everybody's safety. So we certainly lift up that in our prayers. Thank you, Alice. Yeah, yeah. They're everywhere, yeah. Yes, Jack. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's always a blessing to have you all join us. So thank you. Any other prayer requests? Well, I certainly would like to throw in the PNC of St. Andrew as you all continue to minister uh, and uh, be guided by God's, uh, God's direction. Let us pray. Uh, when I say, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond with, hear our prayer. Loving God, in every gathering of Christian believers, you bring together a people of gifts, strengths, and needs to manifest the universal body of Christ. We pray for your church throughout the world, that every local congregation may live as sisters and brothers in harmony, showing forth the light of Christ to the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For the sake of the common good and ordered living, you create human societies to be places of flourishing and strength. We pray for the leaders of governments, and especially for our leaders, local, state, and federal. May they receive wisdom to exercise government with righteousness grounded in truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Alpha and Omega, you are the first and the last, and Christ, the one who was, who is, and who is to come. See us through the tribulations of this world, the afflictions that weaken and destroy us. We pray for those who are sick in body and in mind. May your healing presence be felt in their brokenness. We pray for those who are dead or dying. May your spirit comfort and may peace be with them and their loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, you are the giver of all good things. Receive our prayers that we offer for ourselves and for our world. In all things, grant us the courage to exercise your gifts for the good of our world. Through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And now we are bold to pray as Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand and join with me in singing hymn number 335, Though I May Speak.
please remain, remain standing for the reading of God's holy word. Today's New Testament reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. Jesus is well into his famous Sermon on the Mount. Here he teaches lessons concerning retaliation and having love for one's enemies. Let us now hear the word of our Lord. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. So Jesus tells us to love our enemies and to offer our other cheek to the person who has just slapped us across the face. Pastor and theologian Vaughn, Vaughn Crow Tipton says of this passage in Matthew, congregations respond to this text in the same way my children respond to seeing cooked spinach on their plate at dinner. No matter how much I try to explain the nutritional value, no one around the table really wants to dig in. And it's not just congregations that have a hard time with this text. Pastors and theologians struggle with it too. The fact is, this is a lesson that goes down hard no matter how it is prepared or served. After all, the problem with all this love your enemy and turn the other cheek talk is not just that it seems to us to be intellectually counterintuitive, it seems to run against our very biological nature, our DNA, if you will. After thousands and thousands of years of running around on the savanna, being chased by wild beasts and each other, it's not surprising that when danger arises, we have developed an inherent fight or flight response. This third option of turning around and trying to hug the guy who's been chasing you down with a pointed spear does very little for conflict resolution and in fact is nothing more than an excellent way to get yourself killed. And I think herein lies the biggest problem with our understanding of Jesus' teaching and that is, is that the ideas seem too lofty and too impractical. Yes, in a perfect world we should all behave like Jesus says. But the world is not perfect. And so, like a lot of lofty and impractical ideas, we think the whole thing in reality is just bad advice. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other also. Seriously? But before we dismiss Jesus' teachings as merely aspirational pie-in-the-sky sentiments, we might want to remember who it is that's doing the teaching here. While we may think that Jesus is imploring us to lay down for our oppressors and become the world's doormat, 
We need to remember that Jesus was never anybody's doormat, and he almost never shrank from controversy. To think that Jesus would counsel us to continue to be the victims of violence and oppression or to remain quiet and silent in an abusive relationship is to misunderstand completely what Jesus is teaching us here. In no way, shape, or form is Jesus advocating for a passive response to violence or evil. What has gone misunderstood, and I fear mistranslated for so long, is Jesus' true response to violence and evil, and that is not passive acceptance, but rather nonviolent intervention. Of course, Jesus goes much further than this in his teaching, but let's take a look at his call for nonviolent intervention first, and perhaps we can resolve some of the more troubling aspects of our text today. To begin with, the behaviors Jesus describes, slapping the right cheek, suing in court, and forcing to go a mile, were not the kinds of things that anyone could do. They were the kinds of things that only a privileged few could do and routinely did do to the oppressed crowds that Jesus was teaching to. If we look at slapping someone on the right cheek, this was done by masters to their servants and slaves. Back then, as today, it is a right-hand dominated world. And it was always done by hitting with the back of the right hand across the opposing right cheek. The blow was about status and power over the other. It was not about random violence or fighting among friends or enemies. It was about rank, privilege, and power. And to preserve one's power, one's public standing, it is crucial that everything must be done according to socially accepted protocols. The slave must be obediently standing before you without any external coercion. You must strike the right cheek only with the back of your right hand. Any variation on this would demonstrate that you, as the oppressor, were not in control. It would be a public loss of faith. Now imagine your overlord has just slapped you on your right cheek. Jew. Slave. And without saying a word, you silently turn your head to expose your left cheek. It appears that you are becoming doubly subservient, doubly accepting of your master's authority over you. But what you are actually doing is rendering your master powerless. Turning your right head hides your right cheek and presents your left cheek. But the angle of your head will be such that the master can see but cannot strike your left cheek with the back of his right hand. Try this with a friend and you'll see what happens. <laughs> Turning the cheek would publicly expose the master to shame and ridicule. You would appear to be meek and servile, obediently waiting for the second blow, but the master would be totally helpless. His only option would be to hit you with the palm of his right hand or use his left hand or walk away. All three would cause him to lose face. And when, it, and when it comes to suing you for your tunic and you offering them your cloak as well, we need to first understand that peasants did not sue one another. Again, this is about the privileged abusing the poor. Since peasants quite literally owned only the clothes on their back, being sued for your coat was being sued for the only thing you owned, except, of course, your underwear, which is what a cloak meant. Being seen in your underwear is shameful, so why not publicly expose the shame which allows someone with wealth and privilege to take away the only thing a poor person has by going naked? Give him your underwear too. Let him explain to people why you're naked. In other words, you want my tunic? Okay, you know what? Take it. You want this thing so badly? Take everything. And mind you, this is all done in public. Do you see the transfer of power that's taking place here? 
Do you see how all of the wind is taken out of the aggressor's sails as he is shown to be the bully and the coward that he is? This same nonviolent intervention works with governmental and imperial use as well. Jesus said, if someone forces you to go a mile, walk with him two miles. Back in the days of the Roman Empire, Roman soldiers were allowed to conscript civilians to carry their packs and their weapons for them, but only for a mile. However, this was no minor inconvenience for anyone who worked and fed their family and relied on subsistence day to day. Walking a mile with a heavy pack and then back again could mean missing that day's labor and that day's food for the family. Offering to go the second mile, which was not allowed, publicly exposes the unjust hardship of being forced to go even one mile. But it does so in a way that seems to cooperate while at the same time brings shame and ridicule on the ones doing the forcing. Again, Jesus teaches a way to intervene into the violence and to end the violence without having to resort to the violence. He is offering a way of life in which the poor and the powerless can act from a position of strength to take an initiative which confronts their opponent and leaves the wrong where it belongs. Jesus is teaching the lesson that their dignity does not depend upon how others treat them. Perhaps more to the point, those who follow Jesus do not draw their behavior patterns from those who would victimize them. But of course, Jesus is preaching to more than just the poor and the oppressed. His teaching expands to speak of loving one's enemies, withholding judgment of others, and being at all times merciful. Theologian Brian Stoffergan points out that the ethical concerns of this teaching are entirely worldly. It demonstrates that Jesus is bringing the reign of God into the contested arena of human life. This is Jesus telling us how to live in the here and now, in the everyday, with our everyday neighbors. And when Jesus talks about us receiving the measure that we give, he's not talking about some type of heavenly reward for extraordinary behavior on earth. He's talking about the radical transformation that we will undergo in our lives as we follow these commandments and begin to live a life in God's kingdom. These lessons are hard, alien, and seemingly impossible. But I tell you, they are the only way to genuinely live a life with Christ. It's as if Jesus was saying, I call you to live your lives out of an alternative version of reality. I call you to live your lives as lives that reverse the values of this culture. <coughs> I call you to love your enemy, turn the other cheek, give your possessions to those in need, and judge not the lives of others. Be merciful, even as I am merciful. I have come to nourish your entire life with my mercy. I have come to empower you with mercy in order that you may indeed live a new kind of life in this world. In order to live this new kind of life, we have to employ much of the teaching in today's gospel text, cultivating qualities of compassion, forbearance, and forgiveness, not just within ourselves, but within, within each other, as a community of believers, as members of the body of Christ. Brian Finlayson writes, such a community is a powerful witness to the world. On October 2nd, 2006, a local milk tank delivery driver named Charles Carl Roberts IV backed his pickup truck to the front of the one-room Amish schoolhouse known as the West Nickel Mines School in Bart Township in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. After gaining access on a ruse, he produced a firearm and ordered the schoolboys to bring in more weapons and barricade materials from his truck. He then let the boys go and lined 10 of the girls up against the wall of the schoolhouse. 
before the police or anyone else could intercede, Roberts had shot eight of the 10 girls, killing five of them, and had then turned the gun on himself. On the very day of the shooting, a grandfather of one of the murdered Amish girls warned the young men in the community not to hate the killer, saying, we must not think evil of this man. Another of the Amish fathers noted, he had a mother and a wife and a soul, and now he is standing before a just God. An Amish neighbor comforted the shooter's family and extended forgiveness to them. And an Amish man held the shooter's sobbing father in his arms for hours, comforting him. The Amish community then set up a charitable fund for the shooter's family. And more than 30 of the Amish community attended the shooter's funeral. Marie Roberts, the wife of the shooter, was one of the few outsiders invited to the funerals of the little girls. Marie Roberts wrote an open letter to her Amish neighbors thanking them for their forgiveness, grace, and mercy. She wrote, your love for our family has helped to provide the healing we so desperately need. Gifts you've given have touched our hearts in a way no words can describe. Your compassion has reached beyond our family, beyond our community, and is changing our world. And for this, we sincerely thank you. Such a community is indeed a powerful witness to the world. Of course, it is not the superhuman effort of everyone in that Amish community that made such forgiveness and mercy possible. It is the grace of God that transforms a community that is open to God's reign and is open to living life in God's kingdom. As Vaughn Crow Tipton again points out, the great reward we receive is not full pockets or full garages or even greater self-esteem, but rather it is who we become in the process. But Jesus knows full well that we will never love our enemies without an amazing grace that transforms us and makes us different than what we are. Like the musician, the academic, or the athlete who train mind, body, and spirit to become what they need to be to master their art, we too can become more than the sum of our parts. But the hard truth is that practice may make us better, but it will not make us Christian. What changes us and allows us to love is a grace greater than our sin, greater than our best intentions or even our own hard work. It is a grace where turned cheeks turn violence into justice, where hatred is turned into compassion. It is a grace that lifts up individuals and binds together communities in acts of forgiveness and mercy. It is a grace which transforms the darkness of our sin into the light of God's love. And it is a grace only made possible through the greatest gift ever given. Thanks be to God for that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now, let us rise if we are able and sing our final hymn, number 372, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. <laughs>
To every home you enter, bring peace. To everyone you meet, remember. Our Lord and Savior said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, nor let 